Stop whatever you're doing for a moment and think about this. Where are we going? I don't only mean you or me. I mean our planet and the entire solar system. We've been traveling through space for eternity, but does this journey have any aim or destination? The solar system is moving at a speed of 450,000 miles per hour. Our beautiful blue Earth is snugly tucked inside it, and it seems that our region is quite calm and safe, not like some terrifying experiences our celestial neighbors go through. But where are we going? Just wandering around in a giant circle? Not really. Apparently our galaxy, as well as several nearby galaxies, are being pulled toward a certain region of space. It's about 150 million light years away. The worst thing is that we do not know what exactly it is. That's why we call it simply the Great Attractor. This bizarre area is, unfortunately, on the other side of the Milky Way. That's why we can't see it. This region of the sky is known as the Zone of Avoidance. And it's part of why the Great Attractor is so mysterious. This zone lies in the general direction of the center of our galaxy. And there's too much dust and gas there for us to see far in the visible spectrum. But astronomers can see enough to understand that our galaxy, as well as nearby galaxies, are all moving toward the Great Attractor. It means that something must be making things hurtle in that direction. Could it be a gargantuan black hole hidden in the darkness of the cosmos, pulling things toward it and munching on them? Or is it something even stranger and more dangerous? What we know for sure is that this something is immensely massive. For the first time, evidence of the existence of the Great Attractor was discovered in the 1970s. At that time, scientists didn't have the needed equipment to see through the zone of avoidance. That region blocks most of the visible light coming from beyond. But the good news is that this gas and light can't block all infrared and X-ray light. So when X-ray astronomy became more powerful, people got the opportunity to sneak a peek at objects dwelling in that region. It turned out there was a huge supercluster of galaxies in the region of the Great Attractor. It's now known as the Norma Clusters. This enormous structure, consisting of thousands of galaxies, has a mass of around 1,000 trillion suns. So, the Norma Cluster is massive, that's true, and local galaxies seem to be moving toward it, and still, it doesn't explain all the movements in that region. And now, I'll tell you something even more puzzling and spooky. The mass of the Great Attractor, whatever it is, isn't enough to account for the pull. If we take an even larger region of galaxies, it will become clear that both the Great Attractor and local galaxies are moving towards something even larger. This space behemoth is known as the Shapley Supercluster. It's made up of more than 8,000 galaxies and is as massive as 10 million billion suns or even more. This supercluster is the greatest galaxy cluster we know about within a billion light years. And everything in the universe, Earth, the solar system, even the Great Attractor, are moving toward it. But at the moment, astronomers are still trying to find more information about the Great Attractor. The Hubble Space Telescope is now focused on the region of space where it resides. The largest galaxy visible in the region of the Norma Cluster is ESO 137002. It's a spiral galaxy with large clouds of dust across the galaxy's bulge. Unfortunately, Hubble, being an optical telescope, can't see a tail of glowing X-rays extending out of the galaxy. And in general, observing the Great Attractor is difficult at optical wavelengths. The plane of the Milky Way both outshines and obscures with dust many objects located behind it. And even though we can get some information thanks to infrared or radio observations, the region behind the center of the Milky Way remains an almost complete mystery. Look at these two pictures. At first glance, one might think, well, aren't they showing the exact same thing? Truth is, they don't. But both these subjects are some of the most complex structures humans have ever had the chance to study. The first image shows a cluster of galaxies from our universe. The second is just a small neuron in the human brain. After seeing these images, some were quick to compare them. 
Is the universe nothing more than a huge brain? Now let's not get too excited. Before we go into describing all the similarities between the universe and the human brain, there is something we need to be aware of. It's a little thing called apophonia. And it's when our brains make up similarities between two objects that are seriously unrelated. The best example is when we look at clouds and start to see all sorts of cute animals and weirdly shaped objects. We might be doing the same thing when looking at those two initial pictures. Maybe it's just our brain making up similarities where there aren't any. Some scientists became fascinated with this huge brain universe idea. They wanted to make sure it was not just a weird coincidence. There had to be a way they could measure how the universe compares to the mushy organ inside our heads. So they started with the brain. It's probably one of the most complicated things we know in the whole universe. That's because it's packed with more than 80 billion neurons. These cells are responsible for taking information from our senses and sending out messages all over our body. Try to think of neurons as workers in a factory. They don't just do their work, they actually communicate with each other, thanks to these elements called axons and dendrites. The axons are responsible for carrying electrical signals away from the neuron's body to other neurons or muscles. Dendrites, on the other hand, have the task of receiving that information. All of them together make this mega network of about 100 trillion connections. The universe is one big social network itself, too. But this time, it's made up of galaxies. You might picture the universe as stars and planets with a ton of empty space between them. It's not quite right. What we can see and measure is known as the observable universe, and it's really vast. Think about 90 billion light years across containing hundreds of billions to maybe a few trillion of galaxies. These galaxies, like the one we're standing in at this very moment, are bundled together in groups. Our Milky Way is friends, in a way, with galaxies like Andromeda and Triangulum. And altogether, they're a family called the Local Group. This family of galaxies is part of an even bigger bunch called the Virgo Supercluster. From what we can tell, the space between them might not be empty. It's filled with these threads made up of regular matter, but there might also be this mysterious dark matter doing its thing. Scientists didn't stop there. They decided to take it a bit further. They started by examining thin slices of the human cortex, the part responsible for our thoughts, memories, and even our consciousness. The next step was to compare them with equally thin slices of the universe from a computer simulation. Now it's obvious there's this enormous size difference between the brain and the universe. But the way they looked at it kind of made them somewhat comparable. As they zoomed in, think 40 times magnification, these scientists began noticing that the structures were very much alike. At this zoom, the brain's neural network looked like the universe's galaxy clusters. To make sure they weren't just imagining things, they used two clever methods. The first one looked at how these networks connected and how densely packed they were. They noticed that the middle part of a neuron, or its nucleus, is way tinier compared to its connecting fragments. Likewise, galaxy clusters are tiny when you look at the super long connecting threads between them. The second method was about checking how organized these networks were versus just being random. They looked at how everything was structured around each connection point, whether it was a neuron in the brain or a galaxy cluster in the universe. The resemblance doesn't stop there. We know that our brain is mostly water, about 70% to be precise. Now the cosmic web in space, it too has about 70% of something, only this time it's dark energy. Water and dark energy may not be the most important elements in each of their structures, but they might still play a part in how everything sets up. The analogy continues. You see, the space we'd need on a computer to map out the universe is almost the same as our brain's memory storage. Somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 petabytes. So theoretically, a chunk of the universe could fit in our brains. Or flip that, and our entire life's memories could get stored in the universe's network. There are differences too, and we have to be aware of them to make sure we're assessing things properly. For starters, 
the universe is pretty much the same all over. It doesn't change its composition that much, regardless of where you travel in the observable area. But our brain, not so much. Different parts have different jobs. Also, our brain connections send information depending on things like what you're seeing or touching. On the flip side, the universe's links are just energy. There's also a difference between how these two structures came to be. It turns out that the patterns we see when we're gazing up at the stars are all shaped by gravity and some weird unseen force called dark matter. Massive fireworks in space called supernovae can also affect this cosmic wallpaper. On the opposite side of the spectrum, our brains got their shape from evolution. That long process where animals, including us, get to pass on the best features and data they've learned to their offspring. So, if a trait like a certain shape of the brain helped our ancestors dodge a hungry tiger, that trait got passed down. Our brains are also built the way they are because they're supposed to act like a superhighway for our thoughts. Quick thinking was crucial for people back in the day when they needed shelter from wild animals or the elements. Now, especially if you're a fan of sci-fi literature, you might be wondering, if the universe is like this immense brain, what might its body look like? We might as well be living in someone else's head. We like to think of humans as evolved, intelligent, and at times, hard to understand creatures. But what if we're just tiny neurons in a larger, more complex structure? Well, for the time being, we can only let our imaginations run wild. There's no way we can test at this point what's outside our universe. By all means, we don't even know how large it is. By looking at the parts we can see, the estimations are that the universe is about 95 billion light years in diameter. Even if we'd somehow managed to travel at the speed of light, though that seems a bit impossible at the moment too, it would take an enormous amount of time to reach those supposed edges of the universe. There's also the theory of the multiverse. We don't have much tangible proof of this idea either, but it does claim we live in a universe out of many. Ours has time and space. Other worlds may have different rules and components. Life may look differently out there in ways we can't even understand. Having a better understanding of the universe is just as important as figuring out our brains. You see, we still have many unsolved mysteries right here under our noses or behind our noses to be more precise. There are a lot of things we've yet to figure out about the human brain, like how we store and retrieve memories. We know that each time we learn some new piece of information, our brain changes. But we don't have the entire process mapped out, and it looks like it might take a while before we fully understand it. Now, I don't want to spook you, but there's a chance that our entire Milky Way galaxy is located in the so-called space void. It's a region where there's relatively little matter compared to other corners of the known universe, and it's much less dense than it is elsewhere in the universe. In other words, we might exist in an air bubble in a cake. If that's true, it would mean that we're even lonelier than we thought. Hmm. In our universe, all the galaxies are constantly moving away from each other. In order to understand how far they move away, scientists use something called the hubble Lemaitre constant. It's like a speedometer, but for galaxies. However, there's a cosmic mystery called the Hubble tension. It's challenging what we know about the universe's expansion. Scientists used to consider the hubble Lemaitre constant a reliable guide, but our recent observations question this reliability. The speeds we see in real life don't match up with the distances we calculated and expected. They aren't sure why these measurements don't add up. Researchers followed the moves of supernovas and saw that the universe seems to expand faster around us than it does overall, as if it's actively avoiding us specifically. Hmm. After considering this, they began to assume that we might all live in a cosmic void. Cosmic voids are vast, empty spaces between galaxies, kind of like between my ears. They make our entire world look like a big sponge. Now, let's go back to the beginning, just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Right after the beginning of everything, the universe was a hot, compressed plasma. It only had very tiny variations in density, called quantum fluctuations. After the Big Bang, the universe began to expand. 
Those quantum fluctuations grew together with it, creating regions of varying matter density. Because of that, the universe didn't expand everywhere uniformly. Instead, little claps of matter began to gather together over a long period of time, creating massive structures, galaxies. Galaxies are arranged in huge walls and filaments with enormous gaps in between. And these gaps are voids, also known as dark space. Now, these voids aren't truly empty. In fact, they actually hold more than 15% of the amount of matter found on average throughout the entire universe. They still contain gas, dust, dark matter, and even stars and galaxies. However, they have less density than regions with galaxies, about a tenth of the average matter density, which is why we consider them nearly empty. Usually, they'll have a diameter ranging from about 30 to 300 million light years. That is an enormous distance, even on a space scale. For comparison, most planets and nebulas we found so far have a distance of hundreds and rarely thousands of light years away from us. In the case of voids, if you were in the middle of one, it would just look like seemingly eternal darkness. The closest stars would be so far away that they would be almost invisible to you. Some of them are especially large. They're known as supervoids. The largest known one was creatively named Giant Void. Ooh. It's so big, it's impossible for us to even imagine. 1.5 billion light years away, with a diameter of 1 to 1.3 billion light years. Yeah, it's basically a big dark vacuum. But even this giant vacuum isn't entirely empty. The giant void houses 17 separate galaxy clusters within its expanse. However, it might not be the biggest emptiness in our universe. There's this thing called the CMB cold spot. It's this unusually large and chilly area of our universe that we saw through the microwaves. It really stood out on the map of our universe with its unexpectedly low temperatures, and scientists have spent many years trying to figure out what the thing is. In 2015, scientists proposed that this place might be a supervoid, and probably the largest one ever. Being even more original with this one, they called it the Great Void. If it's true, this place would be an emptiness of about 1.8 billion light years in diameter, about a thousand times larger than typical voids. Not everyone thinks that's possible, so scientists keep arguing over this one. There's another interesting theory going about this place. One researcher suggested that this place might have been a trace on our collision with a parallel world. It's a pretty bold hypothesis, but unfortunately, there's no way for us to confirm or deny it with our current technologies. In any case, As the universe expands, these voids will grow, and the walls connecting galaxy clusters will stretch and break. Eventually, the voids will merge, leaving gravitationally bound galaxy clusters as islands in the expanding emptiness. In other words, sooner or later, the great emptiness will consume everything in our world. So, it turns out, we might be a rare occasion in a supervoid, one of the 15% of matter. This would explain why we're surrounded by relatively few galaxies. This discovery, if true, challenges the standard model of cosmology, which we created with Albert Einstein's help. It would mean that gravity in general behaves differently than what we expected. According to the standard model, such a significant underdensity shouldn't exist. Because of that, scientists will have to explore and consider this idea thoroughly. It might just challenge our very basic understanding of physics. The scientists call this the local hole. The discovery of the local hole may hold clues to explaining the Fermi paradox. Maybe in this specific part of the universe, where we hang out, the chance of intelligent life developing anywhere nearby is very low. Perhaps all of the sentient beings hang out somewhere beyond our supervoid. But that doesn't mean we should lose hope or that life anywhere nearby is impossible. In fact, life in the universe might be much more common than we previously thought. We know that the inner planets, like Mercury and Venus, are inhospitable due to extreme conditions. However, Venus looks interesting because, even though it's a crazy toxic planet, scientists believe that it was very Earth-like in the past. It could have even hosted life. Unfortunately, it was too close to the sun, and all the nice conditions evaporated over time. 
But there's a possibility of microbial life surviving in its high-altitude clouds. Mars, a cold desert, also might have been a friendlier place in the past with rivers and lakes. Though now it lacks a protective atmosphere, ancient life might have existed there. In that case, it would leave potential fossils and underground microbes could still survive. We've discovered some signs of them, but are still debating whether this stuff was truly organic or not. The gas giants, like Jupiter and Saturn, and ice giants are not ideal for life. But their moons offer hope. Europa has an ocean beneath its icy surface, making it a potential hotspot. Encephalus releases water into space, carrying complex molecules that hint at interesting possibilities. And Titan is especially unique. It has liquid bodies on its surface, rivers and lakes of hydrocarbons. While its frigid temperatures aren't great for life, scientists ponder if it might host life with a different kind of chemistry. However, it will take us decades to check all these celestial bodies and study them properly. We haven't sent anything so far since the times of Voyager 2. But if we're lucky, we might explore our solar system during the 21st century. We might explore our solar system during the 21st century. In any case, there's a lot of potential for life even in our solar system alone. Not even mentioning all the planets and galaxies we found nearby. Our estimates suggest that the observable universe, the one we can see, might host around 5.3 trillion habitable worlds. One of the most likely candidates so far is Kepler-186f. It's a potential Earth-like planet, just 10% larger than Earth. This planet orbits a red dwarf star, which is a star a bit dimmer, colder, but more long-living than our Sun. And it's only about 490 light-years away, which may sound like a lot, but remember what distances we've discussed with supervoids. So even if we really are in a supervoid, we're still lucky to have many galaxies and planets around. And if one day, we'll find a way to travel through the universe, leaving the local hole probably wouldn't be a problem. We fly away from Earth to look at it from a distance. It glows like a holiday tree. Big cities look like yellow spots at night. And during the day, we see strange structures, like a palm tree-shaped island in the UAE, or a dark band that runs all the way through China, the Great Wall. These are traces of human existence. Now let's point our telescope at other planets. Mars? It's just an empty, endless desert. Venus? Only rocks and volcanoes. Even if we look into distant space, all the planets out there are deserted and lifeless. Not a single trace of an extraterrestrial civilization. Many people are convinced that life on Earth isn't unique at all. Here's our galaxy. There are billions of sun-like stars. And here is the entire observable universe with billions of such galaxies. There's an almost infinite number of stars. And near each of them, there may be habitable worlds. But we may not have found life on other planets because it hides from us under the surface. For example, there's Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, slightly smaller than our moon. Its structure resembles a soft-boiled egg. Its surface is a hard crust of ice. But if you take a big enough drill, you can get to the liquid yolk, an ocean of water. Jupiter and its satellites are very far from the sun, so it's quite cold there, about 270 degrees below zero. So liquid water instantly turns to ice. But Jupiter has a strong gravitational force. That causes a lot of friction inside Europa, and its core heats up. The heat melts the ice, and we have a watery ocean under the surface. Water is the foundation of all life, so there could be simple bacteria in that ocean. And who knows, maybe there are other life forms out there. For example, weirdly shaped fish. Because of the weak gravity, their bodies are built differently or something like whales feeding on plankton. In 2009, scientists found a planet that is completely covered by an ocean, GJ1214. It's about 40 light years from Earth, and about 75% of its mass is water. Still, the temperatures on this planet are so high that water evaporates and takes the form of super liquid water. There's so much steam that it feels as thick as water itself. No life could exist in such conditions. But scientists have recently found at least 24 planets better than Earth and called them superhabitable. These planets orbit distant stars in their habitable zone. It's the sweet spot at a perfect distance from the star. In our solar system, Venus, Earth, and Mars are in this zone. A superhabitable planet must be 10% larger than Earth and have stronger gravity. 
That way, it can have a denser atmosphere. A temperature 8 degrees higher than on Earth would make the planet more humid. This would encourage a variety of living organisms there. These planets may be great for life, but it's hard to tell if there is life there already. The main marker that would confirm the existence of an advanced civilization there might be radio waves. Imagine a habitable planet similar to Earth. In the process of evolution, intelligent beings appeared there, like humans. They're much taller because of low gravity, and their eyes are adapted to the light from another star, much brighter than the sun. Sooner or later, this civilization will have to use radio waves to communicate with each other. We can think of these waves as loud sound from speakers. Here's Earth. We're now actively using radio waves, and the noise coming from our planet is pretty serious. If a neighboring planet had radio telescopes, big dishes that catch these waves, they would realize that life is blooming here. There are many radio telescopes on Earth that are pointed into distant space, waiting for a signal from aliens. But we haven't received anything yet. Still, that doesn't mean there isn't a planet somewhere in the universe that emits radio waves. It's all about distance. We're jumping 200 light years to another star. Suppose there's a planet X where life exists. The civilization here is advanced enough to use radio waves. So they release the first wave into space. Our radio telescopes won't be able to pick it up until 200 years later. This also works the other way around. Radio communication on Earth has only existed since 1895. Our radio signal won't reach Planet X until 2095. And only then, the aliens will hear our voice. But this radio noise doesn't stay for long. Every year, our technology improves and our radio noise decreases. We're beginning to use mobile communication, cable TV, and fiber optics. This all reduces the volume of our planet in the radio spectrum. And soon, it will simply become invisible to other planets. The same thing is happening on the other side. So, the radio waves coming from civilizations are a brief blip on the cosmic scale. And we can't accept radio silence as proof that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. A giant telescope, which could take a direct photo of a possibly inhabited planet, would change the situation. We zoom in on the photo, and there it is! We see alien cities with tall buildings and lots of antennas. But now, we can't look that far away. We can take pictures of Mars and its satellites, and even their quality misleads us. For example, Sidonia. It looks just like a human face on Mars. We thought there used to be an ancient civilization there that made some sort of sculpture or memorial. More extravagant theories said it was the remains of a giant human. And there's a whole body of it under the sands of Mars. But in fact, it was just a hill. Strong winds blew out some hollows there. And when there was a shadow in those hollows, we took them for human eyes and a mouth. Or a monolith on Mars' satellite Phobos. We found a smooth rock there that was almost as tall as the Pyramid of Cheops. The news has spawned many theories about the civilization that built it. But it turned out to be no more than a rock. The infinite number of stars and worlds around them almost guarantees the existence of other civilizations. So why wouldn't they come to Earth, right? We think that life throughout the universe develops in similar scenarios. The emergence of simple life forms, followed by evolution and growth of a technologically advanced civilization. But just like on Earth, cataclysms happen there too, causing mass extinctions. Meteorites, for example. Perhaps there was a civilization out there ready to go into outer space. But a huge meteorite, like the one that wiped the dinosaurs off the Earth's surface, made that civilization disappear. And life on that planet began a new cycle from scratch. In addition, the more advanced the civilization, the greater the risk of its self-destruction. Scientists might conduct experiments in machines like the Large Hadron Collider and accidentally create a black hole there. It would begin to swallow everything around it and grow in size. Soon, all the super-developed cities of this civilization and the entire planet would simply disappear. Another possibility for super-advanced civilizations is to travel through wormholes. Those are tunnels in space-time between universes. Aliens might travel through them and lose interest in going back. But it's also possible that life on Earth is unique. That's because our planet was formed thanks to a number of incredible coincidences. The first is the location of our solar system in the galaxy. In the Milky Way, there are constant fireworks of exploding supernovae. The radiation from these explosions destroys everything around it at great distances. Our solar system is right in the sweet spot of the galactic orbit where we're safe from such explosions. Another factor is the Moon. 
One theory of the formation of the Moon says that about 4.5 billion years ago, a meteorite the size of Mars crashed into us. If the impact had been straight, the Earth would have just broken apart. And if that meteorite had only scratched the Earth, the pieces would have just flown away. But the collision occurred precisely so that part of the meteorite remained in Earth's orbit and formed the Moon. Then, the Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation and heated our core with gravity. Only then, our planet developed a magnetic field, which protects us from the solar wind. Other scientists believe that life outside Earth may be biochemically different. Carbon and water are the basis of our bodies, but carbon could be replaced with silicon or phosphorus, and water could be replaced with ammonia or methane. These atoms could form molecules of different shapes and perhaps assemble into a living organism. Life based on such elements would be unlike anything seen on Earth. What if someone told you that life actually creates the universe? We're all used to the fact that the universe exists outside of us and was created with the Big Bang. But what if, in reality, it's us who create not just houses and cars, but the whole world? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, let's discuss this fascinating theory. For centuries, there's been one way of thinking about the universe. It's brought us amazing discoveries and inventions that have changed our lives. But guess what? This model might be running out of steam. Scientists say that the universe was created from the Big Bang. Then, it was just a bunch of lifeless particles bouncing around until they started creating stars, then planets, and finally us. The current model is logical and well thought out. But the problem is, it's still full of unexplained things. For example, it can't explain how life came to be in the first place. Sure, we can understand how life evolved and changed over time, but the real mystery is how it all began. When exactly did we humans become conscious? How do a bunch of molecules in a brain create our thoughts and experiences? That's a real head-scratcher. And even if we put the life and consciousness stuff aside, the current model falls short in explaining the basics of our universe. We know about the Big Bang, but where did this Big Bang come from? How can something come from nothing? It's a great puzzle, and we don't have the answer yet. Well, here comes Dr. Robert Lanza and his wild idea called biocentrism. In 2007, he wrote a scientific article about how biology could join forces with quantum physics. It was so cool that two years later, Lanza and his friend Bob Berman wrote a book that expanded the ideas from the article. So what does Lanza actually believe? Well, he basically says that everything we perceive is within our minds. That everything, the whole universe, is all in your head. Of course, this idea isn't new at all, but Lanza tries to combine it with astrobiology and quantum physics to explain how exactly life creates the world instead of the other way around. His theory says that biology is the boss of the universe. He thinks that if scientists want to come up with a theory of everything, they need to start with biology as the foundation. According to him, our consciousness plays a big role in how we see the world. Space and time aren't real things, but more like how our animal brains understand stuff. Lanza also says biocentrism helps explain a lot of quantum paradoxes and puzzles. He even thinks that it might be a better way to bring all of physics together than Einstein's famous theory of relativity. So, let's take a look at seven important ideas in biocentrism. The first one says that reality is connected to our consciousness, and what we see depends on us looking at it. We've got this idea that the universe exists on its own, even when we're not looking at it. If you have the kitchen in your house, the kitchen is always there, right? Well, not exactly. Our eyes capture tiny packets of light, but the real perception of colors, shapes, and movement happens in the back of our brains. Everything we see is because of light bouncing off objects and interacting with our brain. So, without our brains, the kitchen would be just a bunch of random particles. In other words, when you're not in the kitchen, there's no real kitchen there. It's just a bunch of possibilities, like a shimmering swarm of matter and energy. It's pretty challenging to think about, isn't it? But to truly understand the universe, we need to go beyond our habitual ways of thinking. 
We need to embrace a viewpoint that's simpler, yet more demanding than what we're used to. We need to look at the world in a whole new way. Next, the second and third ideas say that particles behave differently when we watch them. Sounds creepy, right? But it's actually true. We observe this phenomenon many times in many experiments in quantum mechanics. Yes, particles actually change their behavior if they know they're being observed. It gets even crazier. Some particles can even instantly influence each other, no matter how far apart they are. It's like little atoms have a secret connection that defies space and time. This is why Lanza believes that bringing the observer into the picture, like us humans with our thoughts and perceptions, can help us understand things better. He thinks that the observer is the missing puzzle piece that can help us find a way to bring all the laws of the universe together. The fourth idea says that consciousness is super important, and without it, things get all fuzzy. Like we said, everything is intertwined, and there's no separate universe out there that's not connected to living things. Biocentrism suggests that the external world, everything we see, actually depends on us, the biological creatures. We're not just passive observers with clear windows to the world. In fact, without us interacting with the world, it's like the universe isn't really there. Just like the kitchen disappears when we're not there, and the universe is all about how we experience it. Reality is a dance between us and the world. It's a whole new way of understanding everything. The fifth idea points out that the universe seems to be just right for life to exist. There are over 200 things in the universe that have to be just right for life and consciousness to exist. If the Big Bang had been even slightly stronger, everything would have zoomed by too quickly for galaxies and life to form. That means no us. And if the forces of nature, like gravity, and the strong nuclear force were tweaked even a little, atoms wouldn't hold together, stars wouldn't ignite, and we would be left with plain vanilla hydrogen everywhere. Of course, there's many theories on why this could be the case. We could also look at this phenomenon the other way. It's not that things were made this way specifically for us, but our existence is a result of things being this way. We're just the result of particle movements and certain conditions. Biocentrism, however, has a more fun way to look at it. Life creates the universe. The universe and its parameters are a reflection of the logic of our existence as living beings. And finally, the sixth and seventh ideas say that space and time are not things, but tools our animal brains use. Think about it for a moment. Does time really exist? Well, the reality of time is a bit shaky. According to biocentrism, time is simply our way of making sense of the world, a tool for understanding. It's not some external force. Our mind weaves together snapshots of information, creating the illusion of time. So when we perceive time passing, it's just our human perception at work. And what about space? In our daily lives, we think of space as a vast container without walls. But in reality, space is full, not empty. There's no fixed measure of distance anywhere. You believe that you're far away from your kitchen, but everything around us is just a bunch of atoms almost without any empty space in it. Well, there you have the basic ideas of biocentrism. In his books, Lanza explores these ideas very deeply and tries to answer philosophical questions. Like if death is just an illusion, or if plants are aware of things. They even talk about whether machines can ever become conscious. Some people aren't sure if this theory can be proven right or wrong. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to test it right now. But Lanza hopes that in the future we can do cool experiments, like huge quantum superposition thingies, or either prove or disprove his theory. Until then, it's more like a cool idea than anything. No matter which theory you prefer, one thing is clear. We live in a truly peculiar world. So let's keep exploring it and discover new amazing things. There are a lot of unanswered questions in physics. How did universal energy and matter appear? Where did gravity come from? And much more. We've been trying for years to get answers to these questions. And one of the people who tried to do this was Paramahamsa Tiwari, the author of the so-called Space Vortex Theory. 
What is this theory, and what does it say about the hidden laws of our universe? Let's figure it out. Parama Hamza Tiwari was the former executive director of the Nuclear Power Corporation, India. He took the Space Vortex Theory, or SVT for short, first proposed by René Descartes, and finalized it. He was always inspired by physics and its greats, even since his days as an electrical engineering student. After rigorous studies of the laws of physics, he discovered new equations defining matter and the mass and charge of the electron. After that, he came up with the SVT. This theory tried to explain the unexplained phenomena in physics, including the creation of the electron and gravitational, electrostatic, and electromagnetic energy fields, as well as other things. It also described the six hidden laws of the universe that underlie our entire world. But first of all, let's talk about the theory itself. Space vortex theory suggests that the universe is made up of vortices, or swirling patterns of energy. And according to SVT, these vortices are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. They're the driving force behind the laws of physics and the fundamental principles of our world. Basically, everything in the universe is connected and interconnected through these vortices. This theory isn't very based on any real observations, but rather on mathematical models and computational modeling. For example, some computational models showed how these vortices work in hydrodynamics and plasma physics. They showed that vortices in such systems can have a central point of attraction and can be interconnected. Other models were used to study how the energies inside the vortices move and how they can create different frequencies and vibrations. But some experts have criticized SVT for using only models and simulations. The biggest criticism is that this theory can't actually be tested. It relies on mathematics and not on some experimental data. That's why it's not accepted as a mainstream scientific theory. But it's still quite interesting and provides a unique perspective on the universe and our understanding of the laws of physics. For example, according to SVT, the universe has some underlying, hidden rules that cause the creation of fundamental matter, their assembly, and movement. What are these laws and what do they say? Well, let's take a look at them. Law 1. The universe has only one primordial entity space, i.e. absolute vacuum, that structures matter. This law states that space is the fundamental building block of the universe and that it's responsible for structuring matter. It suggests that space is the fundamental entity that creates and maintains the structure of matter and that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles like electrons and positrons. Let's try to put it in simple words. Imagine that the universe is like a big Lego set. Just like how all the Lego bricks are made up of the same basic building blocks, the universe is made up of the same fundamental building blocks too. And these blocks are called electrons and positrons. But what holds these blocks together? Space, of course. Space gives it shape and structure, just like how the plastic container holds all the Lego bricks together in a set. So, the first law states that space is the fundamental building block that structures matter and holds everything together in the universe. Law 2. Matter is constituted with multiples of only one kind of fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. This law states that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles, the electron and positron. These two are the Lego blocks we've talked about before. And, according to the second law, these tiny invisible particles make up everything, from a tiny atom to a giant galaxy. Just like no matter what the shape or size our LEGO build is, it's still made up of the same building blocks. Law 3. The field distribution in space, as recognized by contemporary physics, linked with and emanating from matter, are effects arising from only one fundamental field in space. This law states that the fields recognized by contemporary physics, such as the electromagnetic and gravitational fields, are effects arising from a single fundamental field in space. It suggests that this fundamental field is responsible for creating everything that we observe in the universe. 
So let's try to put it simply. This time, imagine that the universe is like a big playground. All the different fields we observe, such as the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, are like different games we play in there. But no matter what we play, we're still in one fundamental space. This is the playground itself. It's the base that holds everything together. According to the third law, without the playground, we wouldn't be able to play any games. And without this fundamental field in space, we wouldn't be able to observe any fields in the universe. Law 4. There is no void in space anywhere in the whole universe except at the centers of the fundamental particles of matter, electrons and positrons. This law states that there's no truly empty space in the universe and that all space is filled with the fundamental field, the one we talked about before. It says that electrons and positrons can be found everywhere, and even the things we consider to be empty, like vacuum, are actually full of tiny particles. And according to this law, the only truly empty spaces we can find in the universe are at the centers of the fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. Law 5. From only one fundamental universal constant, all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics are derivable. This law states that all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics can be derived from a single fundamental universal constant. It suggests that all the constants in physics are interconnected and can be explained by a single fundamental principle. I know you've been doing a lot of imagining lately, but bear with me. This time, please imagine the universe as a big recipe. All the constants in physics, such as the speed of light, the gravitational constant, and the Planck constant are like the ingredients. They're very different and there are tons of them. But just like how all the ingredients in a recipe are interconnected and come together to make one dish, all the constants in physics come together to make the universe. And, just like how a recipe has a main ingredient that holds everything together, physics also has a single fundamental constant that holds everything together. Law 6. The spatial structure of submicrocosmic fundamental matter is repetitive uniformly in the spatial structures of macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. This law states that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales, from subatomic particles to macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. It suggests that the same fundamental principles govern the structure of matter at all scales. Let's go back to the analogy with the recipes and cooking. Using different ingredients and combining them in different ways, the chef can create new dishes. These will all be different dishes and they can be very simple or very complex, but when creating them, the chef still applies the same basic rules and knowledge they have, right? And just like that, the universe also creates different structures, from atoms to planets, stars and galaxies. But it still uses the same fundamental principles to create all these things. So, this law suggests that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales. These are the six fundamental laws of the universe according to the SVT, and even though it's not accepted by mainstream science, it's still a pretty interesting concept.